I'm Leah, and I will be reading to you from Peter and Wendy by J.M. Barry, and I will also be illustrating Peter Pan for you. Chapter 1. Peter Breaks Through All children, except one, grow up. They soon know they will grow up, and the way Wendy knew was this. One day, when she was two years old, she was playing in a garden, and she plucked another flower and ran with it to her mother. I suppose she must have looked rather delightful, for Mrs. Darling put her hand to her heart and cried, Oh, why can't she remain like this forever? This was all that passed between them on the subject, but henceforth Wendy knew that she must grow up. You always know after your two. Two is the beginning of the end. Of course, they lived at 14, and until Wendy came, her mother was the chief one. She was a lovely lady with a romantic mind and such a sweet, mocking mouth. Her romantic mind was like the tiny boxes, one within the other, that come from the puzzling east. However, many you discover, there is always one more, and her sweet, mocking mouth had one kiss on it that Wendy could never get, though there was though there it was, perfectly conspicuous in the right-hand corner. The way Mr. Darling won her was this. The many gentlemen who had been bo- boys when she was a girl, the way Mr. Darling won her was this. The many gentlemen who had been boys when she was a girl discovered simultaneously that they loved her, and they all ran to her house to propose to her except Mr. Darling, who took a cab and nipped in first. And so he got her. He got all of her, except the innermost box of the kiss. He never knew about the box, and in time he gave up trying for the kiss. Wendy thought Napoleon could have got it, but I can picture him trying, and then going off in a passion, slamming the door. Mr. Darling used to boast to Wendy that her mother not only loved him, but respected him. He was one of those deep ones who knows about stocks and shares. Of course, no one really knows, but he quite seemed to know, and he often said stocks were up and shares were down in a way that would have made any woman respect him. Mrs. Darling was married in white, and at first she kept the books perfectly, almost gleefully, as if it were a game. Not so much as a Brussels sprout went missing, but by and by whole cauliflowers dropped out, and instead of them there were pictures of babies without faces. She drew them when she should have been totting up. They were Mrs. Darling's guesses. Wendy came first, then John, then Michael. For a week or two after Wendy came, it was doubtful whether they would be able to keep her, as she was another mouth to feed. Mr. Darling was frightfully proud of her, and he was very honorable, and he sat on the edge of Mrs. Darling's bed, holding her hand and calculating expenses, while she looked at him imploringly. She wanted to risk it, come what might, but that was not his way. His way was with a pencil and a piece of paper, and if she confused him with suggestions, he had to begin at it all from the beginning. Now don't interrupt he would beg of her. I have one pound seventeen here and two six at the office. I can cut off my coffee at the office, say ten shillings, making two nine and six with your eighteen and three makes three nine seven with five not not and my checkbook makes eight nine seven Who is that moving? Eight, nine, seven, dot, and carry the seven. Don't speak my own. And the pound you let to that man who came to the door. Quiet, my child. Dot and carry, child. There, you've done it. Did I say nine, nine, seven? Yes, I said nine, nine, seven. The question is, can we try it for a year on nine, nine, seven? Of course we can, George, she cried, but she was prejudiced in Wendy's favor, and he was really the grander character of the two. Remember mumps, 
he warned her almost threateningly, and off he went again. Mumps one pound, that is what I have put down, but I dare say it would be more like thirty shillings. Don't speak. Measles, one five, German measles, half a guinea, makes two fifteen six. Don't waggle your finger. Whooping cough, say fifteen shillings. And so on it went, and it added up differently each time, but at last Wendy just got through, with mumps reduced to twelve six, and the two kinds of measles treated as one. There was the same excitement over John, and Michael had an even narrower squeak. But both were kept, and soon you might have seen the three of them going in a row to Mrs. Folsom's kindergarten school, accompanied by their nurse. Mrs. Darling loved to have everything just so, and Mr. Darling had a passion for being exactly like his neighbors, so, of course, they had a nurse. As they were poor, owing to the amount of milk the children drank, this nurse was a prim Newfoundland dog called Nana, who had belonged to no one in particular until the darlings engaged her. She had always thought children important, however, and the darlings had become acquainted with her in Kingston's garden. She proved to be quite a treasure of a nurse. How thorough she was at bath time! and up at any moment of the night if one of her charges made the slightest cry. Of course, her kennel was in the nursery. She had a genius for knowing when a cough is a thing to have no patience with and when it needs stocking round your throat. No nursery could possibly have been conducted more cor- correctly, and Mr. Darley knew it. Yet he sometimes wondered uneasily whether their neighbors talked. He had his position in the city to consider. Nana also troubled him in another way. He had sometimes a feeling that she did not admire him. I know she admires you tremendously, George, Mrs. Darling would assure him, and then she would sign to the children to be specifically nice to father. Lovely dances followed in which the only other servant, Liza, would sometimes be allowed to join. The gaiety of those romps, and the gayest of all, was Mrs. Darling, who would pirouette so wildly that all you could see of her was the kiss, and then, if you had a dash at her, you might have got it. There was never a simpler, happier family until the coming of Peter Pan.